And there you have it. <laughs> so hopefully that works. Yeah, Adam now has the uh, the uh, authority to record. So, and I, I guess we do expect this group to be a little bit smaller since it is uh, going to be more technical in nature and focus just on the the middle piece of doing the uh, doing the simulation work. Um, it's not the same overview. As we did that last session. All right, still, still see a few people coming in. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Give uh, one more minute. Okay, Rob, we can probably get going. I mean, we have, we have 37 here, which there were about 50 in the overall this morning. So I think this is more than I had uh, anticipated. Perfect. All right. Well, we will go ahead and, and get started. Adam, I just put two links uh, in our uh, in the, the Teams dialog box. If you could open those up in just a minute, I'll, uh, we'll, I'll ask you to pull those over. Um, the um, so just welcome. This is, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. This is training session number two for the simulation guidelines. Uh, this is uh, focused on uh, VISIM and using VISIM to do simulation modeling, specifically in Kentucky, but it's applicable uh, more broadly than that. And uh, before I say anything else, uh, Scott, I see you are on with us again. I have your camera on, so I was going to turn it over to you to, yeah, for opening remarks. Wait, but, but you're on mute. Some people say I sound better that way. <laughs> uh, Adam, you did a great job this morning, kind of uh, bringing us introduction to this uh, guidance document. And by the looks of uh, all the attendees, got a, you've got an interesting um, uh, group of participants. And uh, um, like I said earlier, um, we're excited about uh, bringing forward uh, to the next level, um, a level of, of, um, of consistency uh, and hopefully efficiency uh, to uh, travel uh, to the micro simulation modeling process. I, I see we've got some project managers here that I'm glad to have you all on board. You don't have to know all the uh, what goes in to make the sausage, but uh, recognizing that all sausages aren't created equal is a wonderful uh, way of appreciating uh, the, the talent that, that you all have as far as your modelers are concerned. Uh, but without further ado, um, I, uh, I'll let you take over, uh, Rob and Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, we are going to do introductions like we did last time. Let folks type it in just a moment, but uh, I'd like to take a quick, uh, quick second to do a, a safety moment, which this morning I, I took a little different twist. Um, and so, Adam, could you pull over the uh, links? This is going to be kind of a health and safety moment. Um, and I know that I know because I know Adam is not familiar with this, that not everyone on here is familiar with blue zones and, uh, so if you haven't heard of blue zones, uh, you know, it's maybe something to uh, to check into. 
um, just to, to look into. And Adam, can you click on the one to the right? It's a Penn State link, it's the, the other link. Um, blue zones are communities um, that all over the world that have uh, essentially longer lifespans because of how they live. And uh, so that involves, um, you know, healthy living and safe living. So they have, have long lifespans. And if you scroll down a little bit, Adam, there are, there are kind of nine principles. I'm just gonna draw attention to one. So uh, there's the move naturally, sense of purpose, and I'm the, manage your stress. So I'm gonna just have you pause there. So one of the nine is manage your stress. And uh, so I'm gonna call that uh, living um, a healthy and a safe lifestyle where you're, you're managing your stress and, and, uh, and not letting uh, all the stuff that we do, we all work hard, um, you know, uh, uh, impact us negatively um, to the extent we're able. So, so uh, if you have never looked up blue zones, that's all I'm going to say. Check it out. See if it's uh, if any of that is uh, of interest to you. Uh, they again, they're all over. There's uh, one community in the United States, and then there's several overseas, and they uh, they live in um, you know a way that they end up with the longest lifespans around the globe. So, all right, you can take that off the screen, Adam, and back to the the rest. So that was just the um, kind of uh, safety and health moment. And um, the next thing is uh, kind of some housekeeping. The, uh, and for those who are with you, this, with us this morning, uh, same things. Um, we do want to encourage open discussion. So, uh, and there was some good discussion this morning and hopefully we have um, more this afternoon. Uh, so you can use the chat box. You can send a message uh, to just Adam or just me. If you don't want to send it to everyone or you can send the message to everyone, you can use the raise hand feature. You can also unmute yourself um, to, uh, to ask a question. Um, and we'll have opportunities uh, to use to ask questions through Mentimeter or to give feedback through Mentimeter as well. Uh, when you're not speaking, do ask that everyone stay uh, on mute and, um, and keep the cameras off as I think you all have just for bandwidth purposes. But if you come off mute and you want to, um, speak with your hands feel free um it is being recorded so we'll make that available and uh plenty of time for questions questions and answers so all right so moving on from there it, to uh the introductions uh, and we're going to do introductions with mentimeter and to get to the mentimeter you've got to uh open up another browser window and you can choose your browser of preference and go to menti.com. You can also use your, your phone if you want to. You don't have to use, if you've got just your laptop in front of you, you can use your phone for the Menti um, and go to menti.com and type in that code right there. And, uh, and you will get access to some questions we're gonna ask. And the very first one is going to ask you for your, your name, the uh, firm or agency that you are with and um, your email. So we have good contact information. And your favorite animal. We switched it this morning was food, and that's your favorite animal. Not not mandatory. You don't have to do that. But um, but a lot of favorite animals. <laughs> For those of you who are dog lovers or cat lovers, now's a good opportunity to, to claim it if you uh, if you if you're uh, devoted one way or the other. Um, but uh, or my son and dog-in-law had a pig for a while. That pig, you know, if that's your thing, now's your chance to say, that's my animal. Um, so, all right, thank you. And so this is important. This is, this is uh, it might seem trivial, but this is a way for us to make sure um, we have your email information, especially if you didn't do it this morning and, and you're either new to this session or didn't get to it this morning. Uh, we do want emails for everybody so we can make sure we, we have uh, the right contact information. So uh, thank you to everyone who's done it. Looks like 28 out of 42. Um, it's good to good to know. It looks like dogs are dogs are popular and winning, but the occasional polar bear and gorilla and octopus. <laughs> so uh, all right, a couple couple more moments here. I learned about a new animal over the weekend. It's a the largest rodent. It does look like the rodent. Yeah, it's a very, very large rodent they have a problem with in Argentina and some communities. Kind of it's brand new to me. Size of a dog. All right. I 
think we got most everybody. So let's uh, let's move on. So next uh, next up after introductions is the agenda. We've got uh, kind of generally these ten items. Kind of one we're we're doing right now, and then uh, benefits of VSIM, VSIM versions. We're not going to spend a lot on time on two and uh, three that is kind of important because it does relate to functionality. Um, then four and five, they got the general software overview, the coding best practices, and then six is where we're getting into the nine parameters that are uh, in the guideline document. Uh, and then we'll talk about some issues, documentation, and, and resources. So, so that's kind of the general flow of today. And uh, next slide is to confirm that you are, you know where you are. This is uh, session number two. Um, and uh, we blocked out two hours. We don't necessarily have to use the two hours. We went a little bit shy of that this morning, and uh, it really depends on on uh, questions and uh, and everything. How much time we take? If folks have questions, we'll go we'll go as long as as we need to. And uh, and there's one more tomorrow. I'll say from one to three. And so these second two are, as Scott said, they're the sausage making. What goes kind of once you've scoped out your job and you're you're in the doing. Um, those are the two the two sessions for for the doing of the simulation modeling. All right, so so that's where we are. And and uh, next uh, slide, I think Adam is uh, yeah, is the the folks involved. Got uh, Scott, Jay, Connor, David, and Noah. Thank you to all of them uh, for their uh, feedback throughout and participation and and leadership and and uh, so that. Um, Great to work with and the folks there at the bottom are the folks that are uh, actually participating in the sessions today and tomorrow. Um, and uh, the um, other thing I'll mention, and I'm just looking, I think I, I saw Lindsay's name pop across before, but I do want to mention, uh, Lindsay, I know we called you out this, this morning. I, it's appropriate, I think, to just mention you um, as well as having been involved at the beginning of this. and. And help get this uh, kicked off and and all of the phase one work done. So, um, so that is it for uh, the team members. And uh, we go now into a couple of uh, more mentee questions to get a sense of uh, yeah who where everybody is. I, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, please go ahead back to mentee and um, put in. Uh, how many of you have uh, heard of Islam? Let's make sure it's yeah. So we won't stick here too long. But uh, yeah, it is anonymous to 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 say if if it's a no, we just kind of want to know and then go on to the next question, which is: Have you opened Islam? Kind of there's those have heard of it, but maybe haven't ever used it. So we'll get a, a few no's on this one, and just kind of get a sense of the audience here. Of okay, yeah. 70, 30, so approximately. And then how many of you actually develop models? You really, you're in the point of like It's about, it's about what probably expected. Uh, most people, if you attended this session, you've heard of the software and you've opened it before maybe, but, um, but now we're kind of more even split on an actual doing the modeling. So um, it's just kind of, uh, good to understand uh, what level we're dealing with uh, as far as the group goes and in, in terms of um, as we get more into the weeds uh, of the actual software. So uh, obviously the first question was more of a, you know, uh, we knew everyone would answer probably yes, uh, considering I mentioned it also this morning. So if you hadn't heard of it, you heard of it two hours ago. Um, but uh, I guess at a, at a higher level, this is not really, um, you know, this, this next two hour or two hours isn't really meant to be a, um, I haven't ever opened the software, I haven't ever used the software. So at the end of, the, by 3 p.m., I'll be, you know, coding complex networks and making uh, detailed VISA models. It, so, so it isn't a, um, a one-stop shop for learning the software uh, and neither is, um, Tomorrow's session on Transmodeler, it's it's a um, hopefully just kind of a uh, a bit of a refresher and a bit of a high level kind of overview skimming what the uh, software can do, um, some kind of troubleshooting, uh, best practices, and 
kind of uh, how we're recommending using the parameters and, and moving forward with the Kentucky um, uh, guidance document. So I just wanted to mention that up front that uh, you know we're not we're not planning to uh, use this time to, to teach somebody exactly how to model. It would uh, that would be a very impressive um, use of two hours, but. Um, but, but it will get into details, um, but it'll be details. Yeah. Um, kind of specific um, to, yeah, situations, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so so just at a high level, I just wanted to, for those of you that um, are, are less familiar maybe, it's, uh, you know, what is VSIM um, or VSIM, as people pronounce it, um, one way or the other, or you see it, um, in toggle case like that with just the V capitalized, or you see it in all caps. Um, it's the PTV micro simulation software. Um, so uh, the third bullet there, PTV has several other products um, that are uh, complementary to VSIM. Um, Vasum and Vistro. Uh, Vasum is more on the travel demand side, and, and Vistro is more um, on the deterministic, um, kind of a, a similar product to. Uh, maybe uh, synchro HCS kind of uh, realm. So, uh, but they, but they all integrate together, and um, they also have the alliterative names. Um, but uh, VSIM has uh, about eleven versions. There are a bunch of underlying builds to those eleven versions. But um, I guess for me, I've been kind of I learned version five four in in college, and then. I've been working in seven to uh, 2020 um, since since uh, kind of getting out of school and entering the field. So um, so it's been around for a while. It's it's I guess the the most used micro simulation software. Um, just kind of pulling that from their literature. Uh, but uh, the other thing is it's it's very customizable. Um, you can uh, kind of more so than more of the traditional deterministic softwares that you that you see. So you can you can really analyze any kind of situation. Um, one of the benefits to using it uh, can be used for any kinds of uh, uh, traffic analysis. So uh, I was mentioning this earlier, but um, and uh, and I'll point out uh, Tom's comment as well from this morning. But but really, uh, micro simulations of this M transmodeler, uh, Amson, they they have the ability to look at um, interrupted and uninterrupted and uninterrupted flow conditions, so arterials and freeways, um, and also how they come together. So you can create models that are just one or the other, or you can create models that have both aspects. Um, and, uh, and and Tom Creasy mentioned this morning, I think he might be on this call, but that uh, the a later version of the highway capacity software um, is going to uh, also incorporate that. So um, Ramps and ramp terminals, uh, so uh, those can be analyzed in a more deterministic uh, way. But um, as of now, you'd have to kind of create multiple files for um, or mul use multiple software. So the customizability um, and then the ability to analyze different conditions. Um, it also has a pretty large user base, just uh, people who have been using the software, so you, you can. Uh, find people internally to your firm or, you know, YouTube tutorials, or um, I know there's like a LinkedIn, you know, VISM forum uh, that people post questions or um, seek out help. Um, and then it's often a tool that if you're not someone that's doing the modeling, you might have seen this at a public meeting or in a presentation. It has a lot of visualization aspects. So it's, uh, you know, it, it looks, you can use it to, to represent kind of a 3D world and um, there's a lot of customizability in that. So, um, so I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the versions. Um, I mentioned again this the, uh, in the earlier session, but uh, everything is updating all the time. So um, there are new versions of VSIM. I, I think almost every year they, they're producing a version. Um, and there are certainly benefits and aspects to these that um, I don't have listed here in this table, but in terms of how the parameters that we were looking at and how the guidance document is tailoring to these um, 
different versions. Uh, there's just some things that uh, I thought were worthwhile pointing out. So um, I mentioned that I learned 5.4 and that was kind of my introduction to the software. So, so I didn't really have any background before that, but um, 5.4 goes to either six or seven, which is like a kind of a more major update. And, and now it feels like uh, the versions since then have been kind of updates in, inside the same framework. So um, the same kind of control settings and uh, network coding and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it might be worth uh, just, I have a couple different versions open and uh, it might be worth just kind of showing some of these features. So I, I know that um, in our discussions with KYTC, just talking about, um, you know, the, the difference between using nine or 10 um, or 11 or 20 or 2020, I guess, those have been the main discussion points. So a lot of the work that we use to develop the um, parameter files and documentation has been primarily based on um, 2020, just because that, that was when we started the project. Um, I know there are some new features in the newer versions, but uh, this really has, I think, what we needed for integrating the, um, the parameter files. So uh, I'll talk about this later, but um, multiple behaviors within, it's really within both uh, Weedemann 99 and Weedemann 74, but uh, particularly we're using it for Weedemann 74 for uh, a multi-distributional um, standstill distance value. And then um, in 10, they're introducing the ability to use a time distribution for um, for headway, and then um, in, in 2020, you can you can change the lane change distances to be distribution. So so those three features are are uh, relatively important um, to what we're recommending now. If, if you have a project and um, you know you have 10 or 11, um, you know do you have to have this or do you have to have this? It's you know you could would depend on the project and likely it's not required, but um, you know, the, the newer versions are gonna have all the things that the old versions have. Um, so um, I guess just to, to kind of show what I'm talking about uh, a little bit, I have a version of nine and a version of 11 open. So 11 is on the right and in the orange and um, Nine is on the left. Uh, I'm not a Florida Gators fan, but those were just the colors to help me differentiate between them. So, um, just uh, didn't didn't want to receive any kind of rude emails. But um, so if I open the driving behaviors, for example, um, another screen, but. You can see, uh, and if and if you only have one of these versions, you you know, it's hard to see what what you don't have. So, I felt like this was maybe a worthwhile exercise of, you know, if you go over here to the car following model, um, uh, in this one, in, in nine, it's all it's all in this one tab, right? So you can see that all these um, following distances uh, that are on the left here. Um, and I'm just opening a fresh file, so it's in meters, which is, again, something I'll uh, recommend you not do. But um, the uh, the lane change distances, uh, the lane changing behavior, sorry, is is in the um, in its own tab. But the car following model is separated out in 11. And here I could add multiple different vehicle distributions, um, and then change, you know, this standstill distance factor. Um, and then kind of in another tab, change the uh, percentage of that distribution, which is uh, what we're loading into the seed files and what we're recommending to be used to change the standstill distance. Um, talked with PTV, and this was kind of the best way to work around the fact that you can't change the, um, the variability of the distribution. It's, it's a normal distribution with a fixed standard deviation. So, um, so yeah, this this feature is in 11, not in nine, um, and it, it's kind of you know it would be worth mentioning in that way. And then, 
so, so Adam, I just gonna some, so if you've got nine, you couldn't, for example, use the standstill information that we recommend in the guidance document. Correct. Yeah, you you could make your impossible. own. Yeah, you you could make your own. Um, you could change it from um, six feet to let's say you wanted to change it to nine feet, but you couldn't. It, it can't expand the distribution. Right. Right. It can't be wider. So so yeah. you're limited, and, and in the same way. Um, you know, if, if you got into the freeway driving behavior and you wanted to um, change the headway, so, so nine actually does have distributions um, as does 11. So uh, you can you can start editing those uh, as a distribution or just as a, a singular value. So, um, so I just thought it was Kind of worthwhile to point that out and, and then on the lane changing um i don't have any links drawn but uh in the links settings you can um you can kind of uh, specify that you want it to be uh the lane change distance is defined by a distribution which you can define um which that that setting is not really available in, in previous versions so um i actually i'm um, ahead of myself here because it's not in 11. So, um, so I guess I didn't actually show that. Yeah, on, on, well, on, the, on, so on that point, um, you know, 11 has things at 10, doesn't have 2020, 20, 2021 has that new, uh, has some new features, but if you've got 2020, you'll be able to do most everything that we have in the guidance document. Correct. Um, yeah, and that, that's as of right now, I guess. I don't want to say that's going to be uh, perpetual throughout history, but as of now, everything that we've prepared is, is based on 2020. So if you had 2020, you could load in all the parameters as, as we kind of anticipated them to be loaded. Um, right. and, and the same if you had 21 or 22. So, right. um, But uh, it is worth mentioning just because I know that microsimulation is not um, often the very forefront of um, everything we're doing. And, uh, you know, like with anything, it's it's hard to know exactly when you need to upgrade. Uh, you know, um, if, you, if you watch enough TV, you'd think you need to buy a new cell phone or a new car every couple of months. So, um, you know, the, there are features that are available, obviously, and, and uh, something important to notice and something important to discuss when you're starting a project, I think. So um, as we were working on this, some someone was starting a project and uh, and KOTC reached out and, and you know, we, we let them uh, use the, the draft seed files that we created, uh, but they were using version 10. And then, uh, so there was some discussion there about, um, oh, can this be done or, or should this parameter actually just be kind of estimated using 10 since it can't be, um, Standstill distance again can't be read in uh, because that feature wasn't available. So um, it's not required for every project, but something worth um, noting before you start. Um, so again, this is something that, uh, depending on how familiar you are with the project, uh, with the software, I mean, um, this is kind of the just overview of the Vism Network Editor. I just wanted to kind of spend some time. Uh, talking about this, and and I can pull it up and and demonstrate. But um, you know, this top section here is kind of grouped into there. There are these gray bars between each section, but uh, grouped into the kind of physical attributes of the network. And then the, the blue is more of the um, vehicle control or uh, volume aspects of the network. Um, mainly there with a Traditional model, you're using vehicle inputs and vehicle routes. Um, I have used the uh, the public transport stops, um, and then uh, parking lots are sometimes used if you're setting up a, a DTA model or something like that um, for kind of source sinks. Um, and then uh, the gray is more of the analysis pieces, so setting up how you're going to uh, collect your data, analyze your network. Um, Typically, kind of drawing nodes around intersections or junction points, and then um, setting data collection points uh, in a way that that's in my mind. I'm thinking of those usually as like 
uh, it, like real world data collection points. So you'd have um, a traffic counter across a lane or something collecting speed information. Um, uh, and, and it can collect a ton of different things, but uh, you do kind of set them as markers in the network. And then um, looking at, you know, vehicle travel times and then uh, I don't think I've actually ever used flow bundles or sections, but um, and then uh, the bottom two are more of the visualization features. So um, the purple being uh, just kind of all your settings in your in your model. So um, if you have 3D shapes that you're bringing in, so you wanted to create buildings or trees or uh, medians or what have you, um, background images, uh, pavement markings, these are all kind of things that um, are more visual and uh, not really for the actual analysis of the of the model. And then uh, again, the visual aspect of showing vehicles or pedestrians um, in the network and how they're color coded based on um, performance and stuff like that. So I don't know. I, I, I hopefully that uh, for people that are more new to the software or um, kind of this is a refresher, like that these things are stored in, in these types of ways when you're getting into the actual model coding effort. Um, there are obviously, you know, things that are embedded in, inside all of these top, top tabs where you're going to find all of the kind of background information about most of the parameters that we're, we're kind of proposing edits to. And in that other guidance documents talk about editing from uh, driver behaviors to vehicle classifications to um, lane change distances. All, all that stuff is really uh, under the hood here, but but um, out in front is all of the kind of uh, network setup items, and you're just kind of clicking them on and off like layers in a um, GIS type of program um, or MicroStation kind of program. So, um, so I can I can kind of move on here to uh, talking about more specifics uh, and setup of a network and setup of a model. Um, and uh, this is something I think that is, uh, I kind of harped on it in the, in the morning session and um, maybe it's getting old to everybody, but something that I think is important when you're doing traffic analysis and, and it's kind of setting up the volume peaking. Um, I, I've reviewed a series of models uh, internally, externally, just in different aspects of um, work and uh, and a lot of models either don't have enough of this or it is um, not done to what I would think is the necessary amount uh, or, or degree to show actual volume peaking and uh, um, the seriousness of that, I guess, and uh, and how that could affect the answer at the end of the day. Um, and uh, and here, just in this these three images, I'm kind of showing a, a pretty simple example. If you had a uh, a one hour model that you were trying to look at, um, you know, let's say you're you're just wanting to look at an analysis period of an hour, and you know that the peak falls off after that. You don't you're not concerned with anything else. That's kind of the bare bones level of analysis. Um, you can add obviously um, analysis periods till you know, through the entire day, if you if you had the data and you had the time and desire to model that, but um, by default, it's just going to be, you know, one analysis period of time. You, you set your um, total analysis length to whatever you want. So you, you could say it's two or three hours, but um, it's just going to, you know, your vehicle inputs are just going to be one time period. And and in this case, you know, you, you have it set to 15 minutes um, every 900 seconds um, is a 15 minute period. And so in uh, the case on the right, you'd have kind of two seeding periods to get all the volume you think is gonna be in your network there. And then you have periods three, four, five, and six to actually do the analysis. And so uh, when you then go over to the vehicle inputs, you can see that um, in this very simple network, you have uh, vehicle inputs for each of those time periods at each of these kind of starting points in a network. So um, 
you can put in different volumes for all of those. Um, and, and I guess, like I was saying, I've seen it where this is done completely right. No, no problem. Um, volumes peaked all the way across as you would expect through a peak hour. Um, been done in ways where there is no volume, like there's just one volume. There's just uh, or two volumes, a volume for the seeding and a volume for the peak hour or, um, you know, it, it can go all over the place. But I guess uh, from just a starting point of any traffic analysis discussion, volumes are important. Um, and so setting this up uh, is pretty important. And and uh, in this little demo file I have here, I think I've already set it up, but I, I can um, I can show where I where I got this. So let's just let's just say I deleted these. Um, so now it's kind of back to the way it was in the default, right? So I just have one uh, time period. I just have one time period here where I input my volume. Uh, but all I have to do is kind of come in here and start adding time periods. Um, and I actually will have to re-add them to this table when I want to put them in. But um, not a heavy lift either, so you just throw it over. And now I have all the other time periods that I just added, and I can kind of add my add my volume in as I need to. So, um, and this can be done, at, you know. At any at any point, really, uh, you don't have to do this right up front, and your model's not going to get corrupt. I mean, um, I we were actually working on a project recently where we wanted to extend it uh, by um, like two or three more hours, and it was a model that was already developed, and um, and I was just trying to test to see if the peaking kind of went back down or if if the congestion kept building. So I just added some additional time periods. Uh, create an Excel file to grab to kind of peak the volumes um, or continue what was already in the model. So I copied all these out, looked at how it was peaking, created some factors, and then copied them and pasted them back in. So this is all, um, all these tables uh, work pretty well with Excel. I, I almost always have an Excel file for volumes and routes and stuff like that, but, um, you know, copy, paste, uh, that kind of works pretty seamlessly across the two. So, um, Adam, I'm going to tie this back. So, the guidelines uh, talk about those issues of peaking. They talk about the data side, trying to make sure that up front we're making sure that everyone on, on the project team, because we're uh, generally the we're you know, anticipating audience here we're, that is kind of uh, doing the work. Um, we got to communicate with. Uh, Everyone else up front that, hey, I'm going to need data because I have to do this. So the guidelines talk about um, what the, uh, how this should be set up and what data is required to set it up. Um, and sometimes it's more data than everyone wants to provide. And, and so we as traffic engineers sometimes need to say, wait a minute, I need, I need some more information because I can't do this appropriately if I don't have um, some sense of what is going on um, out there. I can't just, it's not a uniform arrival rate. So, uh, so anyway, this is, uh, this is all in the guidelines and I think gives to hopefully give clarity to those who are doing it, but also to allow us to communicate with others to say, no, the guidelines clearly say, I need to do this. Um, and so we've got clarity on, on, uh, on how to do this from a best practices standpoint. Yeah, and I guess the other thing that I will kind of tack onto that a little bit is um, there, you know, if, uh, if you're familiar with using Synchro, for example, um, it's the software that I've probably used the most for traffic analysis. So, uh, you know, I like it, but I also kind of pick on it here. But, um, you know, Synchro or HCS or just a highway capacity manual, like if you have an hour volume, but it's peaked, um, even if you don't know what the peak is, you can um, simulate that in some way by using a peak hour factor. and um, you can't really do that in um, VISM or Transmodeler. Um, you need to you need to do the peaking. So, um, but yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So uh, 
yeah, hopefully that hopefully that is helpful. Um, again, I'm, I'm just trying to point out some uh, important aspects as uh, to best practices and, and things that we're kind of making reference to in the guidance document. I'm not um, trying to say that this is the law and this is the way it, you know it, it must be done, but uh, just again trying to point some things out as, as helpful hints and, and walk through it if I can. So um, next, I was just going to talk about routing. Uh, I think. Most people are probably familiar uh, a bit with routing, but um, there are really three main types in, in my mind of how things are routed in, in VISM um, or micro simulation, I guess, in some degree. Um, so there's a kind of the most basic level, which is uh, actually ends up being kind of complex, but uh, point to point routing. So um, this routing between each intersection or interchange. Um, and, and there are some settings you can you can do to, to give more advanced notice in the software, but but really um, this changes routing decisions are decided um, essentially at random as you approach a new routing decision. So uh, imagine you're driving and you um, go through an intersection. Um, now you're on the next stretch of road, and it is a bit of a surprise to you uh, what you're doing at the next intersection. It's not quite as significant as that. Uh, you, you know a little bit in advance, but um, if you enable those settings, that, that's the way that it is. So uh, that's not really how people drive um, typically, uh, but but on a smaller network, uh, it has its time and place, I think. Um, and then, uh, especially if you don't have origin destination information or you, you can't make assumptions about it. So, um, you just have traffic volumes uh, might be the way you have to do things, but um, if you have any ODs or you can make assumptions about the ODs, then end to end routing is kind of how it sounds. Um, starting at an origin and going to the destination. So you have sets of routes that start at each origin in a network and go to each destination. So um, as the route, I mean, as the, as the network gets bigger and bigger, obviously this gets more and more complex. Um, because now you have uh, a bunch of legs for every route. You know, no, you know, there's a lot of routes where no one logically might go, but um, typically it's easier to set it up if you have the whole network created. So, um, but again, that's it's more comparable to how we drive. Uh, when I get in my car, I typically know where I'm going, uh, and I've decided how I'm going to get there. Uh, so congestion and things like that seem to be more logical. Um, the third type, uh, dynamic traffic assignment, uh, similar uh, to the first two in that it's using some of those aspects, but it's uh, it's actually kind of the more kind of congestion-based approach. So it, it's more complex. It's it's running through kind of a algorithmic way to decide how to get from an origin to a destination based on all the available travel patterns, like uh, travel paths. Sorry. So if you have a network that has um, multiple ways to get from start to finish, uh, and especially when there's congestion that might impact that, um, then dynamic assignment might make the most sense. Um, obviously, it's more complex and the model can have more variability because um, the volumes are not going to be exactly as you, you've prescribed them. They'll change um, throughout the network. So. Uh, there's goods and the positives and negatives, uh, good and bad to all three of these. Um, but uh, and I think they each have their own kind of time and place and, and use case. But there are also limitations of what they can and can't do, or or when they should or shouldn't be used. So um, yeah, I just uh, this is something that comes up often when you're looking at a model. Someone has routed it one way or the other, and uh, sometimes it. Then, if you're trying to edit it or move it forward, it becomes difficult to follow that same methodology, um, or you know you could find holes in something um, one way or the other. So, um, I was just going to kind of highlight an example, and then I have a few examples um, of different types of projects where the routing might uh, might play a role. So, um, so if this is our study network. Um, I, I can't actually remember where this picture is from. It might be in Louisville, but um, 
an end, end routing example, if we were starting down here, would be to um, to go all the way through the network. You you see, you come up here, turn right, through here, and then turn left, and that, that's one route, right? So it starts at this pink and ends at this blue. Um, but in in the converse, if you had point to point routing, you'd kind of get through this, turn right, and then jump on a new route, go through the next intersection, jump on a new route, next intersection, jump on a new route uh, until the end of your network. And, and they're not always broken down like this. It could group things together, but um, it's just a, a visual difference between, you know, end to end or point to point. So something worth uh, kind of mentioning. Um, I'm just going to pause you there just to say, so uh, comparing those two, um the simulated driver and what you've got on the screen doesn't necessarily know they don't know that they're going to be making a left turn at the final intersection correct and so they may be in the right lane in um, the first um, major street link and they may remain in the right lane until and again depending on the parameters and when they when that vehicle learns that they're going you know is informed they're going to be making a left it'll influence which lane that they're in and that influences the model results and lane changing and, and various various factors. So if you flip back and the other one, they know from the beginning they're going to be making that left. So if it's highly congested, um, they they may choose a lane based on that. Right. And so in this example, I'm just showing one movement, right? But if you had all of these possible movements shown on the screen, the big you know spider network of all the possible combinations of movements. Um, you can imagine that that some people are arriving here and are learning they're going through or that they're going right um, and they're in the left lane or they're in the way of this uh, this example that I'm showing that's going left and now they all have to to make you know these weaving movements where uh, you know you likely wouldn't do that in the real world now in a, in a downtown gridded network or in a smaller arterial network um, probably not a huge deal because it's just not going to make too crazy of an impact. But um, as the network gets bigger and more complex, uh, also, if you're trying to trace through volume, where is it starting, where is it going? It's harder to do this way. But uh, in this method, you have to do a lot more additions at each intersection, right? This is now a through volume here, uh, but it was, it was a right turn volume here. Now it's a through, now it's a through, now it's a left. So. It's uh, yeah. There, again, when you're when you're doing modeling sense. and tracking it, yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off. So, um, I kind of threw maybe a lot of information there. Uh, I wanted to to pause and ask another Menti question, um, and uh, so I'll just pull that up. Um, kind of do we do we want to stop here or do uh, we want to keep going? I know the next few slides have some more about that topic, so don't be afraid to say yes, you have questions. Okay, so we, we did have a question. Um, a few, if I, I didn't prepare a question slide, actually, now I'm thinking about that, but if you want to just uh, use the chat and ask it to me privately, I can try to review it and um, and ask it or rephrase it for the group. Um, but I can kind of keep going with the other slides and, and pause as we're as we go. Um, but in general, it seemed like people were uh, were happy about moving forward. Um, okay, so I'm asked a question about OD data and routing. Um, so uh, Tom, do you mean like how, how is it used? And you use OD data instead of just, you know, turning volumes at each intersection. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, that could be, uh, I, I've always just translated it into uh, kind of the origin destination if you're using end-to-end -end routing. So uh, it's similar to a, a matrix situation, right? You have, um, in, 
vehicle input one and it's going to two, three, four, you know, to infinity, um, then you can kind of set up a, a matrix to then use your OD data. Um, it's, it's really easy if you actually, you're, you're getting the OD data, let's say from street light and you name them the same inputs, then you can, you can create a table that's uh, translates pretty well and you don't have to try to, you know, replace a number with this or something like that, but yeah. Yeah, so I, and I'll just say in here in Kentucky, we have, um, I know in, uh, along the Ohio border, if you're working on a project with the cabinet, um, including everything up in, in the Cincinnati area or um, Ashland area, or if you're working in Louisville, there, there's OD data available to, to you. It's uh, purchased by uh, public agencies and it's available and can allow you to do the end to end. When I look at this graphic on the screen, to me, um, there are only a limited number of situations in Kentucky where dynamic traffic assignment really is is necessary, maybe appropriate, just given the level of effort, level of uh, effort to calibrate the model and and uh, use it. There are definitely situations where it is a, it is um, the right choice, but many times end to end is the right choice, and there are. A few, you know, there's sometimes some point to point is the right choice. Adam, you know, said, you know, we got a really simple situation. C certainly, if you're looking at two intersections, you, you don't want to do anything more complicated than point to point and just kind of put them in there and, and see what happens. But it, it, it's just, it's just, but we've got information, Tom, I think, uh, as, as you all know, it's available to us that can help us to do the end to end um, really well and have uh, a fairly good level of confidence that um, we've got our our uh, travel pattern information um, that it's reasonable and line and hopefully lines up with your volume. So you, you, you put those two pieces together and hopefully they, you don't find that they, hopefully you find that they are compatible. Um, and I, I think, you know, we uh, strongly recommend that. And, and so in this morning's presentation, we emphasize that travel information. I guess, Adam, you, I've never heard it referred to this way. I think you call it a, the uh, first derivative of of the volume data or something of that effect. And, that was a made up uh, thing. I just made up. <laughs> so it's pretty important. It's pretty important. And, uh, and it's now more available than ever. Um, so uh, maybe uh, there's another question in the uh, chat, Adam, and I think maybe we'll get to it in three slides. So maybe you go through these next slides and we hit that question about uh, yeah. grid. Yep. Okay, so the other the other thing I was just going to mention um, about routing just at a higher level is, uh, you know, it's also important to think about what you're going to study with your project. So, um, the first project I ever used the dynamic assignment on was a it was a downtown system where uh, we kind of had volumes that were known, but the project was to look at a road closure. So we're going to close one of the a block of one road, and uh, and then traffic would need to reroute and refigure out how to get from origins to destination. So um, if I would have started that project without knowing that, I would not have used dynamic assignment, right? I would have probably just done my own routing, but because I knew that's where I was headed, um, that was the thing that made the most sense. Um, so it's, it's worth pointing out that to understand your project and not every time, you know, sometimes you don't know what your alternatives are going to be, but in this sense, you probably could have a good handle on uh, what the alternatives you're working on might be. So, um, so I just, a couple of examples, um, in this small example, this is UK's campus. This is a football stadium, um, and, uh, you know, the dorms and, and hospital here. Uh, so if this is your study area, you know, you just have these two intersections, um, it's an arterial network. Uh, there, there isn't a lot of different areas, different ways you can get between these two things, you know, um, the project would really, to me, uh, I think you could either do point to point or end to end. It's a simple network, so end to end would be very fast, but uh, point to point would be even even quicker. And and the lane utilization factors likely wouldn't play a role because you you know the vehicles are able to see one or two routes ahead of them, and uh, and and they're assigned in advance. Uh, they're just not assigned at the beginning. But if uh, one or two routes is all you need to get to the network, then it is the beginning. So. Um, in this simplistic example, uh, you know, 
either point to point or end to end. Uh, dynamic doesn't really uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, you can't really change what you're doing um, in in a situation like this. There's not enough. And even if you zoom this out uh, and pulled this back a bit, uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with this area. Um, you can see there's a football stadium on the uh, on the southern end of the screen, and there's a college campus on the northern side. So um, there's really not a dynamic way through this area. Um, I guess you could go through the parking lots or something, but realistically, there's no there's no cut through. There's no shortcut to to uh, to navigating through this. Um, yeah, there there is a street on the other side of the stadium. I guess it's a comparable facility, but um, it's, it's not close. It's not that close, I guess. So, um, uh, second example here. This is also in Lexington. Um, so I'm just using local examples to me, but uh, they're also in Kentucky. So uh, uh, two birds with one stone, I guess. Um, this is New Circle Road, and if this was your project, again, this is I'm imagining this is a a freeway uh, corridor with. Um, some of the ramp terminals and adjacent uh, intersections on the arterials in there. Um, to this, this type of network, uh, I think it makes the most sense to use end-to-end uh, -end routing. Um, I've seen models and, and uh, discussion of using end-to-end -end, uh, on, the, on the freeways until you get to the ramp terminals and then point-to-point -point from there just because it simplifies the network uh, in some ways to where um, the, the main thing you're looking at is the freeway corridor, and then you're worried about what's going on just at those ramp intersections probably, um, but you're not that worried about what's going on in the arterials. It's not the study of, uh, of your project. So um, if, if you just use the ramp as the ends of your network, the beginnings and ends of your network, uh, it can simplify it and that you don't have an origin, let's say origin one here going to um, going to an off ramp that then goes left, uh, sorry, goes left, goes right, goes through, and then goes somewhere else uh, on these arterial streets. So if you cut it there and then have a series of routes kind of just for this series of intersections, um, that's also an option. So uh, end to end or a combo of the two um, is useful in this kind of scenario. Um, and the third example here is um, downtown Lexington. So um, this is a, you know, if you're looking at a street um, downtown grid like this, there are multiple ways to get between, uh, let's say, corner to corner. If I'm starting here and trying to get to here, is it best to go, you know, an L shape one way or the other, um, or zigzag through the middle? Or, you know, if you're local, maybe you know that, hey, the you know, this street here is one way and it's it's a little bit faster. There's less people on it and then I can cut over again here and cut up here. And so there are multiple ways to get through this. Um, and this is a scenario where likely dynamic traffic assignment um, would work if, you, if your network is large enough and you think there are enough decisions that can be made or could be influenced by travel time, then this is a situation to use DTA. Um, you could use the other, the other two, uh, again, um, end to end would be better, it'd be complex in a smaller network like this, as many streets as are available, but it would also depend on what the goal of your study was. So, um, hopefully that, hopefully that's helpful um, and clears that up a little bit. Uh, it, it isn't a um, one size fits all, it has to be this way or it has to be this way. It has to make sense for your project, so it can be potentially multiple ways. Okay, so uh, I just will jump into these uh, best practices of coding. Um, so I just picked a, an intersection um, that I think could work in either way to code intersection turn lanes and, uh, and configuration. So um, and pull this up on my screen. I did this before the before our call here, as you can see. So cheating a bit, but so. I've coded in all of the uh, the links here that are outlined in blue, and then the connectors to the links are outlined in pink. And so, um, typically, the you know, the best practice way to code an intersection is 
to have the um, the actual part of the intersection be these connectors, um, which are connecting links together. So right, so these two links are connected by this connector. Um, each connector will have a series. I mean, each link will have a series of connectors potentially um, to get them associated with the other uh, the adjacent parts to accommodate all the movement. Um, so a big thing that uh, I guess we we recommend in the guidance document um, uh, the way to code intersection turn lanes and um, in Visim uh, is um, I guess a little clunky. I'm more familiar with Visim, so I don't think of it as clunky. But um, now getting more familiar with Transmodeler, maybe uh, it's just a different approach. But um, you know, in Visim, you're going to want to code the turn lane. So in this example, uh, <coughs> the most common way to do it is coding it as a parallel link. Um, again, this is an intersection that I'm pretty familiar with, so I kind of know how people tend to drive it. Um, and you can see here that this is an offset left turn lane. Uh, I can turn off these links for a second. So you can see that this turn lane's offset. Most people are getting in the turn lane as soon as they can. There's always a little bit of a queue here, a couple of vehicles stacked up. So it's rare that someone is like right here and decides, oh, I did need to go left. They're usually knowing they have to go left way back here. Um, same with this direction. People know well in advance. And actually, this is a little convoluted because um, you do see people kind of jump in this turn lane back here. Uh, uh, but, you know, this is, a, I don't know, Taco Bell or something. But um, so you can see that kind of approach. But on this approach, for example, uh, it's kind of coded the other way that I'm going to demonstrate, but, um, well, let me just show this first. So, so you're coding it as a separate link. It's just one lane here, um, and then a connector to connect from the, um, the through lanes. So vehicles will come along, jump into this link, and now they're, now they're separated, right? These are, in, in the <clears throat> mind of the software, these are two separate identities. Uh, they're, not, they're not going the same place. They're not the same. Um, whereas if you're driving, you're not, you're not thinking about the left turn lane being a separate facility, essentially. So that's one method to code these left turn lanes. Um, and that's kind of typically how you see them coded, especially in scenarios where you know that people get into the lane early. Uh, one issue with doing it this way is that if you are right here, you've missed it. You can't get over now. Now, if you know you're getting in that lane anyway, it's not a big deal. Uh, but but it can sometimes lead to unrealistic, I guess, queuing or driving behavior. So um, that's how I've coded uh, the other approaches to this intersection, as you can see. Uh, but this approach, for example, I've coded in another way. Um, this is less common, but uh, I think would be more applicable in uh, more downtown grid networks where you're changing lanes later, you're getting into the lane you need to be in closer to the intersection, uh, less in advance. Um, and so since this roadway network kind of fans out here, it goes from one lane to uh, kind of four lanes at the intersection, um, people do kind of get in them early, but if you're not as familiar, uh, you know, this is more residential over here and, uh, um, or you're coming off the backs of these kind of shopping pieces, um, you might, you might not know exactly what lane to be in. So you could code it like this, where it's a series of lanes. Now everyone's just kind of picking where they need to go and they should have lane change distances associated with these connectors, um, advance enough to try to get into the lane they need, um, and then a connector, and then uh, a series at the, at the approach to the intersection that doesn't really allow lane changes left or right. So now, now once you're in your slot, that's where you are. So once you're in your lane here, you've kind of made up your mind. Um, and so again, this is the more common way to, to see this intersection be coded, uh, but, but there is a time and place, I guess, um, and a context for coding something like this. It just, you know, it can lead to, if, if it's not, it requires more um, control and more attention to be kind of paid to coding it this way. Uh, okay, so uh, 
Um, ask the question. Uh, how do you code multiple you... downstream? Good. Receiving lanes from from a turn lane. So, uh, let's say uh, in this example, um, right? So I have one left turn, and it's turning into the right turn lane. Uh, actually, I'll use the other approach because this example, the um, everybody turns into the right lane here because the left lane dies at this Home Depot, uh, and you actually see a kind of a crazy weave there often because people don't know that, and they try to race around somebody. But um, so that's actually a good reason to have a model there. But uh, but going this way, I, I'm just using one connector to connect into this left turn lane. Um, that is the recommended way to do it. You, you could have a second connector. I, I could link another. I could link another connector in here to this second lane. Um, oops, picked the wrong lane. Uh, so you could see that I could just, you know, force people to, to either choose this one or this one. Um, but then you have to likely determine which lane you want people in. So. What's the more common way to do it? What what are people actually doing? Uh, but but if you just have them all file into one lane, um, you know that. I guess when you're driving, you do see people you know file into one or the other lane. But um, in this case, if everyone jumps into the left lane, they're all going to be behind each other anyway. Then they can automatically choose what they're doing. So it doesn't doesn't really, I guess from my perspective, likely affect the capacity doing it. You know just into one lane and then as soon as they get to here now whatever they're doing downstream they would decide what you know okay do i immediately just need to get over um, but in, in a situation like this where i have two lanes going to two lanes it's just a, a really cohesive uh, way to do it um, but where i have one lane feeding to two which is feeding to four uh, it's best to do it this way as opposed to um, having it be, yeah, older versions of Vistim, you could actually make it uh, trapezoidal shaped instead of a rectangular shape. It would go out to each of these lanes. So doing it this way just feeds them into the, the actual lanes in front of them, and then they can immediately get over if they need to. Um, yeah, I got a message here. Uh, Johnson, feel free to unmute and, and mention. Yep. So I did, didn't want to interrupt, but like, you know, but uh, so to answer like, you know, Tom's question, I think, you know, there's no direct way of doing that. Like, you know, connecting different number of lanes from like, you know, from like, you know, in between like two, not two different uh, section with different number of lanes. Uh, so we're working on it, but it's not there yet. But like, you know, as like, you know, Adam was laying out, I think, you know, you could do those like multiple connector situation and, you know, uh, you could be using the conditional, uh, uh, how to call it, like, you know, a partial route so that right. like, you can, depending on the situation, like, you know, if that's truck, it may well make wide turns. Or, I mean, I don't know, there could be some conditions like that or like two length and the downstream links and so on and so forth. So those are the the ways that it's being done, but not necessarily there's a direct way that you can model one lane to two lane situation, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, and one real quick thing to add, honestly, I mean, you know, real quick, like, which I found out like, to be quite useful in most cases, which was like, you know, people are using, I mean, they're modeling that like turn base, like how you have modeled uh, that northbound or northwest bound-ish approach, like where, like, you know, you uh, model that as a one big, you know, lane, type, I mean, link, rather than like splitting them up. Uh, because like, you know, when you export things out from some other tools using AM, like it comes out to be this way. So you don't want to like recode it or what, it's fine. I mean, but the, the one of the downside of this was like, you know, you only could get one queue length from this, like, you know, for the entire link, that was the problem. And uh, like, you know, if you want to go around it, uh, and if you want to get like, you know, Q length when you're trying to do the uh, node evaluation for left turns and right turns, you can go down to the end of that like four lane link at the starting point of that four lane link 
and then make sure that there's a like you know connection in between the the two lane link to four lane link like lane number one to lane number one lane number two to lane number four in addition to uh the the two to two connector that you already have does it make sense from that like you know two lane link you can like can you draw a connector from yeah like that but like you can connect that like you know two to four i mean it's just not going to be used for actual routing purposes but it could be used for that evaluation uh, graph drawing purposes in vSIM. So it will know that like, oh yeah, you're standing on the right side lane and then you're gonna go through this like sequence of links and uh, connectors to take you to the right uh, turn movement or left turn movement, so on and so forth. So if you, it's your goal to main, measure those Q length by using node evaluation for different movements, but if your model you know, is created to be this way, uh, that's one of the things that you can also do. Just want to make sure that, like, you know, that's being mentioned because I don't want everyone to recreate the network just because of this. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, Sorry, so you're saying if you export it from something else, it'll import typically more in this one. Correct. So that, yeah. that a lot of times that's not necessarily an, uh, an option for a lot of people. It's given. Uh, unless, mm -hmm. like, you get, like, you know, very relaxed budget and all the money, and I mean, and time on Earth. <laughs> you could do that, but like in a lot of times that's not the case, or all the times that's not the case. So if you want, if you have to stick to this, but you have to measure different queue lengths for different movements, you can add those like you know connectors just like that, like you know to allow VSIM to understand that this uh, like left turn queue and right turn queue and so on and so forth. Just wanted to mention that real quick. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. So I'll jump back to the PowerPoint here. Um, there's more that we could talk about on intersections. Uh, that, that is the main coding piece. Um, it's also important to make sure that you are, you know, coding in things like uh, conflict areas where they make sense. And so you, you typically don't want to have a, a ton of uh, like you know, red, red conflicts, even though this is the kind of thing that will happen. Uh, it, it does kind of, um, depend a lot of times on how you have, uh, I mean, certainly it makes sense, but, um, you know, depending on how you want to code the, the green, the green, red scenarios, like here, for example, you, you're going to want this right turn to yield the through movement. Um, and you can use conflict areas or priority rules to do this kind of thing in VSIM. Um, there's some discussion of that in the guidance. Uh, typically I'm, a person that likes to use conflict areas uh, at intersections, um, but I, I don't want to kind of uh, overdo it in, in the event that uh, I didn't uh, capture something correctly in the queue, the queue spills back, and now we have some kind of weird situation going on. So um, conflict areas, uh, signal heads and signal control, um, you know, you, you're needing, you're gonna wanna place those in the, uh, right, I don't have a signal controller, but you're going to want to place those in the network um, where they make sense. So on the on the uh, the link before they get to the connector, so that it knows what what uh, what to do. Um, and then detectors um, should you should you have your signal set up that way, and and you can modify the signal timing, you know, by hand or importing it in from uh, Synchro or CSV, I think so multiple tools for that kind of thing. Um, and so the other, I just wanted to kind of also go over another uh, freeway merge diverge concept, uh, best practices. Um, so again, here I have uh, coded some uh, of this network and I just kind of want to point out a way to, to code these in. Um, this is, the way that I have uh, kind of read about, about coding these in, but um, you can see that, you know, obviously we don't, uh, you don't usually build lanes like this, it usually tapers out, uh, but, but by coding it like this, where the lane, it's a parallel exit ramp, you have the lane kind of add here on the right, uh, people are not going to use this, this sliver of triangle anyway. They're going to get over um, in a logical way. So this is a very, kind of quick but correct way to code um, these types of diverges. So, uh, and then coding the exits like this. Now this is a maybe a, a simple example where 
Um, this is a parallel exit facility. So vehicles are good in the right and then they exit. You could also edit this link parameters to not allow people from uh, lane changing um, to get back out so they can they can kind of get in, but it's not a way that people can use it to pass. So um, uh, so you can see like people are oh, one too many. Uh, so uh, that that would be an option if you're having trouble with your calibration of the model. But um, yeah, this if people in this third lane are forced to exit, obviously, and people in these two lanes are going to go through. So um, that's a way to code a diverge correctly and uh, kind of based on the best practices that we're recommending. And then the same for a merge area, you typically are going to have some acceleration zone. And so you're going to code it kind of the flip or the reverse. And you could do the same thing here uh, to prevent people from trying to do something like getting over and changing it. You know, this is kind of the starting point. You just are putting in three lanes and, uh, and this lane change distance associated here should be adequate enough that people know, okay, I, I have to get over, I have to change lanes. This is a very short example. Um, is uh, kind of what, what's out there now. Um, and, and you can also kind of influence that with influencing how people are behaving in this right lane. You know, Kentucky, people are pretty forgiving. Um, you, you know, you, you normally would see somebody getting over to allow you easy, to easily merge in, especially in scenarios where they understand that there's not that much distance. So, um, Coded the other side as well, just the, the same idea here. Um, and then this one, this one that could be up for debate about what type of off ramp this is. You've got a lot of space here, but it's not really a parallel lane. So you, you wouldn't have two cars hopefully driving next to each other for any of that time, um, like you would probably over here. You know, you, you could easily see two people being next to each other in these lanes, no problem. But um, in this example, you probably wouldn't see that. And so this is more of a taper design ramp. And, um, and so you're just going to have an, a lane connector here instead of having that kind of parallel link set up. You're just pulling that connector from the through lanes uh, to attach to the ramp link. So um, yeah, I, I, when I'm making these, I, I'd like to keep the connectors relatively short. Um, uh, but but not have the links overlapping with each other. So uh, yeah, that that's uh, you know you, I guess I've seen this type of thing coded in a variety of ways, and there are some ways that you you know it, it's situationally dependent, and sometimes the geometry doesn't exactly lend itself to uh, making the most logical choice. But uh, you want to code to what makes sense with how people are driving. Um, that's the point of the software. It's not to, you know, buy the book and buy the laws and buy the rules of everything, code to exactly what's on the road. You have to uh, kind of code to how people drive. Um, I, I worked on a model in um, New York City and uh, I don't live in New York City. I live in Kentucky. Uh, I don't drive there and there were a bunch of when I looked at it in Google Earth and aerial imagery, there's a bunch of barrels blocking and dividing the road. And I was talking to people on the project, like, hey, I'm putting these as separate lanes and separate facilities. And, uh, and they were saying, well, if you, if you look in street view, people just push those barrels out of the way with their car. They don't, those barrels mean nothing. They're just in the road. And, uh, and so then it was just, I, okay, I need, to, I need to modify the way the network is to reflect how people will actually drive in this network. So, um, small little anecdote, but something it made me think of it. So, um, I did a lot of talking there. So, uh, kind of want to pause and see if anybody has uh, questions or if there's a specific thing that I mentioned, um, that you think is, uh, like go deeper on. Adam, just a quick time check. We've got about 40 minutes left for the next two sections. 
as well. Okay. Okay, so most people are um, okay so far. So I'll keep rolling. A um, couple maybes, and there'll be some time for questions at the end if you want to save them, and maybe I'll hit what you're asking um, as we go through. So um, the next section is really talking about the parameters. So I uh, mentioned it in the session this morning and in, in some previous presentations. Um, with this project, we wanted to uh, make these simulation models uh, tailored more to Kentucky driving. And so we uh, wanted to look at how do some of the most commonly changed parameters uh, impact impact models, impact model behavior? How is it different or similar to the defaults in the software? And so we looked at nine different parameters um, and we used uh, Kentucky data uh, as much as we could. So we collected data, we used historical speed data and VIN data to try to um, just look at uh, what the actual performance is on the roadway. And so from that, we developed uh, recommended kind of values or ranges that um, we're going to kind of uh, use uh, in, in micro simulation models moving forward. So did some pilot projects testing these. Um, but I'm not going to kind of go through all of them, but, um, oops, sorry, I was on the wrong window, but, uh, these are, these are the nine things that we looked at. Um, these are kind of the result graphs. So, um, this is a lot of work being thrown at you in, in nine different tables and graphs. Um, but, um, uh, I guess I just wanted to point out, well, we, uh, we weren't doing nothing and we did kind of come up with some recommendations. Um, and uh, this is kind of what we're hoping gets us closer to calibrated models and uh, reflecting real world conditions and making models that different people develop be more apples to apples. Um, everyone's using a similar vehicle fleet, similar uh, speed ranges, similar um, headway or lane change distance parameters to start from, then it's likely that the models will be more comparable uh, between each other. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of people have talked to, I've talked with a lot of people, I guess, about, you know, there's a lot of leverage you can pull um, to modify software to do what you think it needs to do. But, um, you know, you could pull one really far and then pull the other one not as far. And then the next person might say, uh, I'm not touching lever A, but I'm going to pull lever B all the way down or push it all the way up. And, uh, and so this is, is maybe hopefully tinkering a little bit with a bunch of levers so that it doesn't make everything go crazy out of whack. Um, and that's our goal anyway. Um, tested some, like I mentioned, a couple pilot projects. Um, and it seemed to do that. It seemed to not be perfect, but, but get generally closer to, um, to what a calibrated model might look like than, um, than the default. Um, and in some cases, it was actually closer than some models that were finished. Um, so, uh, in, in certain metrics. So, it, it at least in the other metrics, might not be all the way there, but it, it got you close in travel time, let's say, and then you need to finish uh, rounding out what's going on with the volumes or cues at select locations. So, um, Okay, so all of that is wrapped into some seed files. So these seed files, um, there's really two ways uh, to go about using them. Um, these will be kind of hosted um, inside, embedded in the document and hosted probably on, a, on the document site that you can download them uh, just as a, probably a zip file. Um, and it will contain like the VISM INPX file and uh, and you could either the easiest way is you get a new project, you know, you file new, open the seed file, just save it locally on your machine, open the seed file, and then immediately rename it to whatever your project is. And now you have all the default um, kind of embedded information in your project file. You don't have to worry about um, anything about importing or exporting or um, overwriting your existing data. 
uh, anything like that. So that's by far, you know, the easiest way. Um, I'm sure we've all had a Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel file that we use as a template and then, you know, uh, PowerPoint even, any, any of that stuff. You know, you've had a template file before. Uh, it, this would be the same kind of idea. Um, so that's option one. Uh, I don't think I need to explain that any further. Um, option two is the um, kind of the, the more complex option, but it's like the importing or reading additionally into your existing file. So uh, let's say it's um, October the 12th um, at about 2.25 p.m. and you're hearing about this for the first time, but you're working on a project and you would like to try to use some of these defaults. Um, but you've already created the model, you've already started maybe calibration or you're just in, in that stage uh, of the model. So you don't want to start over. Um, so this might be easier. Uh, so the read additionally is a tool in Vistim to, to do that importing. Um, something that I don't think I knew about from the start. Uh, just like there's a thousand things that I don't, I don't know about still. But um, so uh, to do that practically, you, you know, in a file, you're going to go to file, read additionally, uh, network, and uh, um, so here I can click the C file. So now it's going to pop up a window to ask me all the things that I wanted to read in. Um, and so uh, you can you can click them all on. So it's going to read in all of these things. Uh, all these attributes to a file. Um, in my file, I don't have a lot of this stuff. In the seed file, there's no, there's no links, no signal heads, no stop signs. So um, I'm not going to be able to read in all that geometry, but uh, I could read in all this other stuff if I wanted. Um, most of it is unchanged. It's whatever the default is. So you're just going to read in um, additional materials. But uh, the, the walkthrough that would be included um, in that zip file will be a small text file that will kind of walk through this process. Um, so it'll just kind of explain uh, when you're reading additionally the steps you should follow to do that. Um, and uh, it might take a few tries to get the hang of it. But anyway, let's say you just wanted to click a few things to read, read them in and, um, you know, you just click them on and then it's going to ask you how do you want it how do you want it to uh, approach a conflict uh, and uh, so typically the the um, least resistance way is what it defaults to new key on new key on conflict so let's say color distribution you have color distribution one two three four and five well now it's whatever it reads in it's going to add the number 1000 to that um, so this way you won't override any of your data. You can keep all the stuff you've already messed with and then you can just add these at the end. Um, so you can change this value to anything you want. Um, some people have certain methodologies about how they're coding stuff. So, you know, you could change it to 200 if, if you so choose. And, uh, and then it would all, you could also have it like, you know, I got all the defaults in here. I don't want to read in the additional defaults. So just get rid of those. Um, so anyway, that, that's the that's the process for importing it. Um, and so Stephen had a question, uh, would this seed file work across different VISM versions? Uh, so that, that kind of goes back to something we were mentioning at the beginning of the version discussion. Um, we created a seed file with the intention of using the current version at the time was 2020. So um, everything in there is coded to 2020. I, I believe that it should work for previous versions, and I think it's been tested. Um, I think I've tested it with 11 or 10, and then I know that we provided it for someone at KYTC to use with a previous version, and they were able to use what could be used in that version. Obviously, um, you know, if that feature doesn't exist in the version you're using, you can't read um, you can't read that in. But uh, it, it should be. Um, should be able to be used, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, that that's kind of the import step. Uh, and uh, again, the note will 
try to detail out um, the way to do it. I, I've had the most success uh, just with this and with other projects um, doing the imports in a few steps. I think um, with the things that we've modified, you can do it in two steps. Um, you can certainly do it in more than that. Uh, I guess my encouragement is to using two or three steps. That way, you know that, you know, let's say I'm reading in these values, if something goes wrong. I, I only tried to change three or four things. So I only have to try to check those things and then I can move on. It only takes a second to import them in any way. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the thought process of walking through that. Um, Okay, so uh, I had another Mentimeter. I just was going to think, see if that made sense uh, or if there's more that anybody wanted to hear about different parameters. Um, so if you want to take a second to answer this. Adam, was that uh, did that start from a zero point, or did we have uh, some ones in there? So there were uh, people already responded. Uh, oh. Yeah, I think people had already responded. I had it open early. Got it. Yeah, sorry, that was me. I I had already responded. No problem. <laughs> no trouble at all, dude. <laughs> Overachieving. You were just here early. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I'll just uh, spend like a few minutes. Lane change. On. Time headway, standstill. The high notes, yes. So yeah. Um, so I'll just talk about maybe the these four here really quickly. So um, lane change is the most popular answer here. So I'll, I'll kind of address that. So lane change distance. Um, many of you have edited that uh, probably. Um, it's a thing that you commonly see uh, not edited in models uh, when you first open them. That's like the first thing I go check. Um, but uh, by default, it's it's coded in at um, 200 meters or 600 feet, uh, 656 feet. Um, so um, we're recommending to change it to uh, kind of uh, higher numbers. Uh, you can use a distribution. Um, I, I've created models in the past where I, I changed everything wholesale to 1,000 or 2,000, and then I'm going back through during calibration and tweaking those as they make sense for the area that they're in. Um, now, uh, in the guidance, we're kind of recommending to, to, to start with the default of either the distribution, uh, which we're including in the seed files, or just the values that uh, is included in the trans model or lane change distance. So I think those range from 1,000 to 4,000 uh, for freeways and 800 to 2,500 or 3,000 for arterial streets. So. Um, so yeah, in the, in the later versions of VSIM, you, you can select the distribution and this will increase the variability of when people start to change lanes, um, likely similar to natural driving behaviors. Um, and then, uh, or you can uh, you know, edit them. Which, 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 version, which version is that? Can you, I know that's Question. several slides back, but would you mind just flipping back so everybody kind of has that? Yeah, no problem. That has come up. I just, that is a, Popular discussion topic. Sure. So um, that, that's in 2020. Um, lane changes distances of distribution. So if anyone's using a 11 or 10, I just get. I just want to be explicit here. If, ever, if you're using 10 or 11, you can't use what's in the seed file and the guidance with that new distribution. That's a, a good functionality that's been added, and and uh, and so. Um, so it's just a limitation if you're using an older model, you have to do the second thing that Adam said is set set the values to those higher ranges and then go back through and uh, adjust them. But you can't use a uh, kind of a probability distribution that applies to the vehicles on all the vehicles. So, And, and this is, yeah. And, and so this is a, um, a, a very much a starting point. Um, lane change distance is uh, very subjective to the area that you're modeling, and uh, and so we're just hoping to get you off center here with some values, and then certainly tailor it to 
um, network performance and, and field observations of what's going on uh, and, and edit those values as, as distributions or as values, you know, uh, people change lanes here one mile ahead of time. Like, okay, well, if they start doing that, then uh, it's, you know, a fine thing to note. Uh, and people will start to do that and try to do that in the model. But, um, okay, so then uh, uh, quickly hit on uh, time headway, uh, second most popular thing here. So uh, time headway, we, we looked at um, freeway conditions um, using trajectory data uh, and kind of uh, created a distribution function and we're recommending a range for time headways between um, 0.7 and uh, 1.4, 1.5, I, I can't exactly remember, um, which 0.9 is the default. So we're recommending to use the default and then expanding it up and down. So, you, you know, we're not, we're certainly not saying you should be using 0.7 uh, as a, uh, for your whole model, it's it's very aggressive. Uh, nor should you probably use 1.5 for your whole model, but uh, it gives you some leeway to either try a distribution, um, which is also included, or to try different values within that range in order to get closer. Now, the, the 0.9 did make sense with what we were um, experiencing in the data, so I can just quickly show the graph. So 0.9 is this line here, and this is our data set. Um, this is observed data, and so um, we're just trying to make it translate back to what this is. Now, this is about the 0.7 range. Uh, these data points in here are pretty aggressive, and so this is the, the headway people are trying to achieve and not the headway that's being experienced. So that, that was something to consider um, in car following. This is the type of headway trying to be achieved. So we don't want to be programming for everybody to be driving uh, 0.4 seconds from the other driver in front of them, nor does everyone drive two and a half seconds behind. So um, yeah, the default value is pretty representative, but we wanted to recommend a range of what seemed realistic. Minimum headway um, is, is only used in tight uh, conditions when someone has to make a lane change. So it's it's how tight someone will get within another car, uh, distance in VISM. And uh, VISM default, you can see is, well, uh, if you have very good vision, you can maybe see it's, it's 1.64 feet. Um, and some of our data points were in that, in that realm, several data points under five feet um, from that, with those that we collected. So we didn't have a reason to change this. It doesn't impact the model. Um, other than in those congested conditions. So people aren't just naturally wanting to be that close. Uh, I assume most of you have been in a car before. That's a very, uh, that's a very tight distance to, to want to drive, but um, if it meant you were on or off the road, you would maybe do it. So, um, and then the last one is standstill distance. So um, I mentioned this before, but the, the curve for standstill distance uh, are these tighter distributions um, as you can see, this is kind of the default distribution here in the middle, uh, but it's a pretty tight curve. Our data is more sprawling than that. Um, these kind of blue curves, uh, these blue circles. Um, and so uh, in the later versions of VISM, you can simulate kind of three curves, which is what we, uh, we pushed through um, to uh, widen the band of that distribution. So you actually have vehicle classes that are showing up at um, different percentages. It's, it's the same vehicle class, but they're just programmed in there at three different compositions to um, simulate this type of distribution of um, standstill distances. So, uh, so, yeah, so I'm just going to summarize that, Adam, real quick. To say, so we we uh this now allows us to have the three tall distributions which creates the flatter distribution i mean so you know when you put them all together it it results in uh what we were looking for which was something that goes from uh, about five feet out to uh around 13 feet again if you uh you have the magnifying glass on this slide but it's uh it's easier to read in the manual <laughs> But yeah, so you, you get the general gist here that it's it's it is a uh, a wider range of standstill distances, and so I think we're able to achieve it 
Uh, again, it's a later version that allows that functionality. Yeah. Um, so uh, where were we? We were about here. Uh, so I guess I just wanted to um, kind of move move to the next section. Um, just kind of wrap up the presentation here um, and leave some time at the end for questions and other discussion. But uh, lane change distances, um, default vehicle fleet, um, volume peaking in conflict areas. There are certainly tons of other things. I, I just uh, I've reviewed a handful of models uh, again uh, internally, externally, um, and not, not trying to pick on anyone other than myself, really. Um, but but you do notice these types of things are often um, little little issues or, or mistakes that that you see in models and that seem to cause erratic behavior. So um, there are other things that you can notice. Um, I've certainly seen some some other stuff. Uh, but but these are just kind of common issues or, or troubleshooting areas to focus on. We've talked about the lane change distances um, a decent amount, and then uh, the vehicle fleet. Uh, we are including a vehicle fleet mix um, that is similar, that is representative of Kentucky, and uh, that's in the seed files. But um, hopefully people are aware that there are U.S. default vehicle fleet uh, that you can it comes with your VISM install package. Uh, you can pull it from the example files and um, that will get you pretty close to what Kentucky's vehicle fleet mix is. And so uh, that just kind of makes the model more representative of uh, real world or Kentucky conditions. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the conflict areas. I, I mentioned that a little bit in the demos, but um, you, you do see some conflict area situations pop up that that don't exactly make sense for um, what's actually happening and can cause uh, weird vehicle interactions. So it's something to look out for when you're making a model or when you're reviewing a model. You know, uh, especially uh, overpasses, underpasses. Um, that's a huge, uh, you know, something that can happen that they're not coded in there, but you might have accidentally clicked one, um, and then. Uh, merge and diverge areas, also another area where there are some conflicts that shouldn't probably be coded. Um, Adam, I'm going to mention one thing about vehicle fleet just, um, as you move to this next slide, and that's uh, trucks just being, uh, you know, every project is unique and uh, different parts of the state have very different um, uh, numbers of, uh, especially tractor trailers and the, you know, single unit tractor, various the trucks are just something uh, for us all to be conscious of um, and making sure that for each project, because you might be in the same area, but you're same geographic area, but you're on a facility that it has a lot more trucks. And so again, you know, we're just kind of raising those as things to look out for. Um, and I showed this earlier, but I'll just pop it over here again, just really quickly. Uh, this is kind of the, the, the guide or the cheat sheet. Um, Of course, when I did that, it took me back. But um, this would let you kind of come in here and say, okay, I have 5% trucks, so what should my new vehicle fleet mix be? Or I have 20% um, trucks, so what's my new vehicle fleet mix? Uh, how does that how does that sum up? So, um, yeah, this is a, a useful, hopefully a useful tool. It's documenting all the results of all the other parameters as well. But um, one that's interactive is that vehicle fleet tab. So, uh, so I just wanted to kind of hit on the results and documentation and a little bit of calibration here. Um, talked about it this morning some uh, in the general session, but uh, this is just kind of the the simulation parameters settings in your in your model. So, setting the time period, um, making sure to set that to record the seeding. The analysis period and potentially if you have a cool down period at the end of your model as the peak is trailing back off um, and then setting a random seed um, number of seed number number of runs and, and random seed increment um, making sure those are set correctly 
um, and they're consistent between all the models you're running it is important just to make sure that um, they're random seeds, but uh, in that they are random. So if you're trying to run a, an AM no build and an AM build model and you're using different seeds and seed increments and numbers of runs, you're not really comparing apples to apples likely. Um, so it, it's just simulating the random arrivals of vehicles. And uh, so it's just important to, to pick something. I think these are the default values in there, but um, pick something that, uh, that you like. Um, in a group that I worked in before, we, we would use uh, the random seed of 1111, and then that same for the increment. I, I kind of now like that number. Um, engineers tend, tend to like numbers, and so, you know, do, do what you like, I guess. But, um, and then the other thing to, to mention, uh, there's likely post-processing that people will do. Um, Again, the copy and paste functionality or the export to um, other file types. I typically am copying and pasting out of there, uh, but, but you can certainly export from um, the sim or have it save uh, kind of database files. But um, making sure that you highlighted the right vehicle classes, um, that, that you want to collect data on probably cars and heavy vehicles, but um, if you're working on a transit project or there are buses or pedestrians and maybe you want to collect that as well and then um, making sure to uh, go through and select the right MOEs that you want um, and then define the, the analysis period. So, um, you know, this stuff is um, reviewed models where I'm like, oh, I, it would have been easier if this was selected and then I can just collect it here and then I end up doing that. But, um, you know, selecting the, the two, the from and to time, um, so during your analysis period, and then the interval you can set to that. You know, I guess my recommendation is setting it at 900 seconds or or less. So you're collecting every 15 minute data. So that's how we want the vehicle, the volume information. Why wouldn't we, you know, want the same for speeds and uh, delay and um, volume and stuff like that? You can always add it up, but it's good to it's good to have that in the breakdown, I guess. Um, when I'm thinking about it, so. Um, and then I, I also wanted to spend some quick time here mentioning that I mentioned before, this is not going to be a uh, how do you um, how do you do MISM or how do you create models, but um, there are resources online. PTV ha hosts uh, a series of um, free kind of training resources uh, on their website. Um, they have a series of videos. Um, that kind of show introductory um, to more advanced things on kind of the the getting to know VISIM section. And then this PTV Talks tooltips um, is another section that uh, can be focused on specific areas. Um, and uh, and so that that's being updated uh, regularly uh, on their site. So I guess I'm including those links here and as we distribute this, you know, you'll be able to see those, but you could probably find them pretty quickly yourself if you were just Googling around. Um, but, you know, this is, this is the site. Uh, I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to what they're doing. And so you can, you can kind of see and, and get, get information firsthand um, from the software developer. And, and uh, you know, uh, these are being updated uh, every so often. Um, so, yeah, uh, that was really all I had um, for this session. If there are more questions, um, I, you can either post them in the chat or feel free to just kind of um, voice your opinion now or uh, type them in the Mentimeter, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. So we are here till, um, till three, or we can stay a little bit after if, if there are multiple questions. But. Thinking somebody's got a question. If not, we can we we can. Uh, it looks like you've got got a question there. Um, do you prefer to use 
the VISM built-in OD estimation tools for end-to-end -end trip route estimation, or do you use hand calculations? Hmm. Okay, that's a great question. I've actually personally never used the OD estimation tools um, in VISM, so uh, I have. I've always so, so that shows your preference. <laughs> hand <Yeah>. count. <laughs> if you don't um, mind, like I can mention real quick about that, like ODME tool. Sure. Uh -huh. Yep. So, I mean, the, there are like, you know, pros and cons of using it, like, you know, but if your if your network, VSIM network is not set to be used as a dynamic assignment, like network, which means that like, if you don't have nodes and whatever parking lots and everything set up, it's going to be a, like, you know, uh, like, you know, you need, you need to go through heavy lifting process to, you know, add them in and everything. Because like, you know, if you, in order to use that OD estimations and flow bundles and so on and so forth, you will need to have that, like, you know, a DTA ready network. So if you have that, it could be an easy, easy, like, you know, process to go through. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't recommend using it <laughs> uh, unless like, again, like, unless your network is set to be like DTA ready. Got it. Okay. And Steve uh -huh. Speth, I'll ask you if on any of these, you don't have to, but chime in if you, uh, if you have another uh, thought or opinion. Okay, we'll do. <laughs> um, Adam, so get on. exactly how I would have. <laughs> Got it. Um, okay, so yeah, somebody else asked a Mentimeter question. Um, can you explain like, the 95th percentile Q links from VISM? Um, so in the um, in the outputs, I think there there should be fields for Q length. There's average Q length. Um, there's maximum Q length. Typically, the maximum Q length is what I've used. Um, I don't think there is a 95th percent Q length unless that's a that's a recent update that I haven't that I'm not aware of. But uh, I guess in some ways. Um, you know, 95th percentile Q length is what we're most familiar with in synchro, or at least I am. Um, and uh, I've run into issues in synchro before looking at that, trying to figure that out. Like, what? Okay, it's 95th percent, and uh, and then if you run some traffic, it's not. It doesn't give you the same thing. It gives you something different. And what's it? What are the details of that? And so I don't know. Digging into the weeds of that, I'm, I'm often left with the 95th percentile Q length is a calculation. Um, and not not exactly experienced because it's deterministic. So, and and this way it would be kind of the maximum would be the experience Q. Um, so, uh, I don't know if Steve or uh, Johnson, if you have other thoughts on yeah. that. But so there are ways that you can get like you know percentile uh, based outputs. Uh, but like you know you know once you enter that aggregation like percentile value, that's going to be applied across the board. So it's not necessarily like, you know, 95th percentile Q length or whatever, something else, but like, you know, it's going to give you an option to get 95th percentile of everything. So if you go to evaluation, if you don't mind, like, you know, you're in 2020. In the configuration. Evaluation. Yeah, I mean, if you go to result, I mean, result management tab, uh, result management tab on the top, you know, that there's a field like right there. So you can add those like, you know, percentile value over there. So if you feel like 86th, because you're a weirdo, go ahead and do that or, or whatever that might be. But like now, I mean, if you say like 95, then like, you know, yeah, I was joking, Adam, like 86 is kind of weird. <laughs> you're not going to get that job next time again. So like, you know, and, and then like once you start running that, like, you know, uh, I mean, the uh, run simulation runs and everything and start getting that like you know, result outputs in a listing window. There are like ways that you can get that aggregated, you know, outputs and everything, which will include average standard deviation, so on and so forth. And then like, you know, it additional uh, uh, percentile value will show up. But one catch to this is that like, you know, we are so used to see those like 85th or I mean, 95th percentile outputs, which is from that statistical calculation. So this is not that it's just like, you know, straight up like real 95th percentile value that it could pull out of. So, um, like, you know, I mean, it's always very important to understand, like, you know, it's, you know, being uh, measured or, uh, are, you know, collected a little differently, right? So, it's not like stati statistical calculation, but it's real, 
like 95th or whatever percentile value that you're looking for. Yeah, it's a measurement, not a calculation. Either way you do it in this sense. Okay. Um, uh, maybe another question here. Okay, so uh, this is a question about calibration. I'm, I'm assuming everyone can still see the screen here, but uh, we do offer, uh, offer. There is some discussion of calibration targets in the guidance document. So um, there's some uh, calibration targets for the common fields of volume, um, uh, travel time, speed, uh, queue length, uh, delay, and that kind of, that kind of thing. And uh, and so. Uh, it's typically, yeah, they're, they're based on um, kind of what has been commonly used in other guidance documents. Uh, I have it up here, actually. So uh, travel time, the the kind of default here would was the within 15% um, or one minute. Uh, and looking at that on, on corridor lengths, so not looking at that between intersections or something small. Um, but looking at it from a from like a quote unquote real origin and destination it doesn't have to be the entire length of your network, but um, in real areas. And then, um, yes. So I guess that's our recommendation uh, of a metric to start from. Again, uh, you know, there is the, uh, the the FHWA analysis toolbox tool that can be used, but um, and I I think there might be some more recommendation in there, but. Uh, this is kind of what we were thinking you'd start from, so. Okay. Questions? Or thoughts? We've got lots of, lots of people, a lot of experience on this list here, but, uh. There might be one more question in the mentee. Oh, yeah, looks like you got it. Yeah. Um, so that that is a very popular question. Uh, the answer is yes. I hope so. So we've been recording this session, and we recorded the morning session. Um, we are finishing with the entire uh, project here. So the seed files and um, the guidance document and uh, these other reference files that have been mentioned. And so all of that hopefully will be hosted um, uh, soon online. And so people can have these presentations um, in the video to uh, rewatch or to watch for the first time. Um, so yes, that is our that is our goal. And so uh, also an advantage of giving your email address in the beginning will be that you'll be notified once this stuff goes live or once it's available. So if you didn't do it at the beginning and you want to do it, you can certainly just type it in right now into the into this uh into this mentee or into the chat, but uh, especially into the mentee would be best. So we're keeping a record of that as well. So with that, I think our time is up. That's a good question to end on. And uh it is three o'clock and we say thank you to all of you for your time and attention and good questions, good discussion. I'm very, very appreciative. Thank you. If anything else comes up, uh, feel free to reach out um, to either of us or to, to Scott or to Jay and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. See you all later.